Hi, and welcome back to Heimler's History Economics Edition. In the last couple of videos, we've been talking about how to measure a nation's income, namely through the measurement of gross domestic product. And in order to understand that fully, we need to talk about something called inflation. Let's get to it. Now, when people talk about inflation, this isn't just some airy economic concept. It actually matters to people's lives. Right now, as I record this, Venezuela is experiencing an economic crisis of epic proportions. Today, they're experiencing inflation somewhere in the neighborhood of a million percent. Now, let me give you some idea of what that means. If I were to take one US dollar today down to Venezuela and exchange it on the street for their currency, I would receive back 236 thousand bolivars. Now before all this inflation mess began, 236,000 bolivars could buy you an entire house in Venezuela. But today, 236,000 bolivars can't even buy you a cheeseburger at McDonald's. And as a result of all this, 90% of Venezuelans are living in abject poverty. So understanding inflation really means something. So what is inflation? Well, put simply, inflation is just a sustained increase in prices of a nation's goods and services. Now, when when prices rise, it's not really a matter of concern in and of itself. For example, if my income is $10,000 this year and a can of Coke costs me $1 to buy and then next year I make $20,000 and that same can is $2, then I'm really in the same position. The price of Coke has doubled, but then so is my income. The concern over inflation occurs when prices start to rise faster than incomes do. So back to our example, if in year two I still make $10,000, the same I made in year one, and that Coke goes to $2, then I'm in trouble because now my dollar only has half the purchasing power that it did in the first year. So the rate at which prices and income diverge is called the inflation rate. And you can calculate it in the following manner. The inflation rate equals the price level in year two minus the price level in year one divided by the price level in year one times 100. So in my previous example, the inflation rate would be $2 minus $1 divided by $1 times 100, which equals 100%. In this case, prices have increased 100%. That means the inflation rate is 100%. Now it's obvious the kind of cost that this would incur to consumers. If people's incomes don't keep pace with the rising of prices, then they have less purchasing power. They can essentially buy less. And that's obvious, but there are other costs associated with inflation that economists deal with also. First, there's what economists call shoe leather costs. When inflation starts to rise, that means that people have less incentive to hold on to the money that's in their pockets or in their bank accounts because the longer it sits there, the less valuable it will be. Now the term shoe leather costs comes from Germany's experience of hyperinflation after World War I. People who had significant wealth saw the value of their money decreasing rapidly and hired people to run around withdrawing their money from one place and investing it in another. And so the cost of all that time and effort was wearing out those runner's shoe leather. The second kind of cost associated with inflation is called menu costs. So go into a grocery store and you'll see items on every shelf, and directly below those items you'll see the prices of those goods. If inflation gets out of control, like say in Venezuela, grocery store employees are having to spend so much of their time adjusting the prices on the shelves when they could be doing other productive things. That's what we mean by menu costs. And the third kind of cost associated with inflation is what's called unit of account costs. And and these costs have to do with the way that inflation makes our currency a less reliable unit of measurement. Down in Venezuela, the government can't print money fast enough. And so lots of people have abandoned using the bolivar altogether and have just started bartering on the streets. So if a country doesn't have a reliable way to measure the value of goods and services, then chaos will erupt. And maybe the worst part of unit of account cost is that it discourages people from entering into long-term contracts. For example, if I live in an economy that's been experiencing long-term inflation and I'm thinking about buying a house, watch what happens. If I go to take out a mortgage this year for $200,000 to pay for the house and then the inflation rate is 100%, next year the house is going to cost me $400,000 and if my income hasn't gone up at all, then I'm in real trouble. Therefore, I'm really unlikely to engage in a long-term contract like that and enough people start thinking that way, it can really tank an economy. Okay, so those are the costs. Now, how do economists track all of this? How is it that they know that inflation is occurring? And in order to measure that, I need to introduce you to the Consumer Price Index. Now take your average family 
and put everything they would normally purchase into a basket. That is called the market basket. Now there are thousands of goods and services that the average family buys that would be considered part of the market basket. You've got purchases of food, entertainment, technology, housing, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics sends its employees out every month into stores and gas stations and retail outlets across the nation to take note of the prices of all of these goods. And the prices of all of these goods in the market basket combined is known as the consumer price index. And the way we calculate it is as follows. The price index in a given year equals the cost of a market basket in a given year divided by the cost of a market basket in the base year times 100. So the current base year against which American economists measure the CPI is 1982 to 1984, which I know is more than one year, but it is what it is. And if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, which is slightly more fun than getting kicked in the face by a horse, then you will find the following chart. So you can see here that the base year is 1982 to 1984, and in that year, the CPI is 100. Always, always, always in the base year, CPI will equal 100. So if you can wade through all of this, you can see here in August of 2018 that the CPI is 252.14. Six. Now, how did they get that number? Well, just like we said before, they took the cost of the market basket in 2018, divided it by the cost of the market basket in 1982 to 1984, multiplied it by 100, and boom, that's your CPI. So what does this number actually mean? Well, it means that since the base year, or base years in this case, prices for the market basket have increased about 152%, which I got by taking 252, subtracting 100. This is the base year, this is the current year, and you get 100. 152. That is the percentage of increase in prices. And is that necessarily a bad thing? Well, not necessarily, according to this chart from the St. Louis Fed, which shows us that incomes have basically risen with prices. The blue line indicates incomes and the red line indicates prices. So right here, you can see we had a little bit of inflation, but here we actually have deinflation because prices are lower than people's incomes. Okay, now it's the CPI that you'll most often hear about in the news. But before we close this down, let me introduce you to one more similar measurement that economists and policymakers pay attention to, namely the PPI or Producer Price Index. And it's the exact same concept except it measures a market basket that producers fill up with goods and services rather than consumers. Producers usually put into their market baskets things like raw materials and electricity and coal and steel. And in some ways, the PPI is much more responsive to inflation and deflation than CPI is. Now, why is that? Well, if you remember all the way back to the concepts of supply and demand, you'll remember that producers or suppliers are really quick to respond to changes in demand by increasing or decreasing prices. So often the PPI is a really good early warning system for inflation. And so now that you understand all of this, it may be outside of our power to really do anything for the Venezuelan government, but at least you'll understand the reason for the crisis and be on your guard for any possibility of it happening here. And how is it that we keep watch? My advice is to visit the Bureau of Labor Statistics website every month and do your calculations. And that probably means we are doomed. I'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you would like me to make more of these videos, then add this channel to your YouTube market basket by hitting the subscribe button. And if you want this video to achieve a hyperinflated level of influence here on YouTube, then hit the like button and that'll tell the good folks at YouTube that this video is worth watching. All right, peace in the Middle East. Word to Big Bird. I'm out.